Hi, I'm Stu Kagan, and welcome to Born Scrappy, the podcast for scrap metal exporters and traders. Join me in conversation with some of the most experienced traders and operators that have helped shape this incredible industry. In today's episode, I'm joined by Darwell Shah. Darwell runs Metco Ventures and is the previous president of the non ferrous board of the BAR. In today's episode, we talk about how to get better prices than your large competitor, losing a large deposit and getting it back, how a crisis helped form the MRAI, expected growth in India, and so much more. So let's get into it and hear from Darwell. But first, intro. Hi, Darwell. How are you? Very well, Stuart. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good. Thanks. Um, I'm glad we could make this happen, not just Finally. because we've been trying trying for a few weeks, but we've been trying for about an hour, maybe half an hour now. And it was I was um, judging you for your sound not working, and it was actually my earphones that weren't. So I'm glad we got to make this happen. Well, for me, it's still noon time, so no problems. But I guess for you, it's like past eight o'clock. So whatever it is, all is well. That ends well. Finally, we are here and all is working. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Everything's working so happy, happy from our side. Dole, I must tell you, um, meeting you for the first time in person at the BIR the other day in Abu Dhabi, um, surrounded by a few um, non ferrous board members at the time, um, you're probably the most liked person in the BIR that I met. The amount of different people that said to me, you should really have Dawal Shah on, on board Scrappy and what a, what a great guy and you know, and he's done so much for the industry. So whatever you're doing, it's absolutely fantastic. And thank you. I think I'm going to have a big fat lunch today <laughs> for all those kind words. <laughs> but don't take people's sense of humor that seriously, you know. <laughs> Sometimes people pull a fast one on me, but no. Yeah, I mean, again, it's been an incredible journey. I think almost uh, I'm in my 27th year uh, in the industry. So um, by the end of the day, um, you know, the idea is that, you know, whatever that I do, I, 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 I kind of, you know, want to uh, make it look good. It has to reflect nicely on my own self, my experience, my knowledge. And uh, that's that's what it is. So I think uh, at BIR, obviously, it's been 20 years and uh, made a lot of uh, friends have had, uh, you know, a lot of great stories to hear, uh, you know, learn from that. And uh, that's what keeps me motivated. That's what keeps me going. So all in all, it's been a happy journey great journey and i i kind of still look forward to doing my bit you know learning from all these experiences and, and all these stories you know yeah you're still young you've got a long way to go but let's go back 27 years tell us a little bit about how you became a part of this industry what the journey's been like and and i guess give us a bit of background on metco ventures as well <laughs> It's quite a funny story, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, so 27 years back when I when I joined this business, uh, Metco, uh, it was uh, historically doing a lot of uh, primary metals. So we used to represent uh, uh, producers from overseas markets uh, selling their primary metals into India. India was still a very closed economy. But then uh, the promoters of the company said, OK, here's our business and this is what we already do. We want to start something different. And uh, that something different came about uh, in the form of, you know, exporting brass uh, handicrafts, artwares uh, sourced from India, selling into the United States. So I was given the responsibility of sourcing these uh, artwares, handicrafts made out of brass. And, uh, you know, we had these uh, big chain stores, mark uh, supermarkets from uh, say the Western world, uh, especially North America, who used to source uh, those products from India. So my job was in that period to, you know, look after these inquiries, what uh, what have been generated and source that from Northern part of India. So I started my career in Delhi. Uh, there's a brass community about 250 kilometers uh, up north, north uh, east, I would say, in a small little village called Muradabad where they make these brass artwares. And, um, we, we started with a planter line, you know, where we uh, source brass planters for these chain stores, these uh, supermarkets. And that's how I started my career. Now, getting into the uh, 
scrap business, uh, as they call it. What, what's the word for that? Serendipity. You know, it's a beautiful accident. So one of the shipments that we made to North America, I remember on a very sort of a should be a wintry day there because it was sometime in December that one of the buyers called and uh, panicked, saying that you know we reject this shipment because uh, the customs in New York. They found uh, something very objectionable. There was a dead rat in one of the packages and they had to re-export that back to India. So we were stuck with that consignment. Uh, the buyer wouldn't take it. And uh, my job was to find a buyer for that. And there was a brass foundry uh, to whom we said that, okay, would you buy this as brass scrap? So he agreed. Uh, we settled for the commercial dumps and uh, he received the consignment was extremely happy delighted to receive such a wonderful consignment of brass scrap yeah. and that was my first step into the scrap industry so that's the that's how the journey started you know? and um i guess since then you tell us a bit about the roles that you've held at the bir and and what medco ventures is about today so as i mentioned that uh, uh, Metco Ventures, uh, which is the name today, but erstwhile name was uh, Margi Industrial Services, where we started off in 1984. So the company has been in business for, I think, now over 36, 37 years. And uh, primarily, we had all these uh, big producers around the world who, who were looking at selling their products into India. So the expertise that we had, we were the marketing experts representing them. But the scrap was something that, or the secondary side of the business, get added or got added on. And as I said, mid '90s was a period where that that change came about. Um, so yeah, Metco as and was a was a selling agency, was a broker who was uh, representing those big producers of the Western world into India. Um, as far as my role with BIR, um, so when we started this journey in the mid '90s, I think uh, uh, in the early 2000s, we realized that you know we need to expand our footprint and I think BIR was a, a very sort of you know a fertile um, forum where you know you can make international connections so while we were sort of you know growing very well in India the idea was to sort of penetrate through the international community you know look at you know creating a supplier base so to speak and you know um, uh, expand our wings and uh, BIR was our first step and I think it's uh, you know there's no looking back since then so um, uh, my first BIR, was in the year 2002 or three. I think uh, we started with Monte Carlo and I, I actually had to fight with my company to be there because it was an expensive proposition that, okay, uh, Mr. Shah, you want to represent us in a, in a forum of scrappies and you want to sort of, you know, do international business, but it's expensive and uh, you better make sure that you, you know, you extract the right value and bring us some profits back home. Uh, it was a disaster, to be honest with you, Stuart, because I was very shy in that period. Um, didn't know where to look at, who to talk to. And, you know, obviously the whole um, the, the, the BIS structure in that period was very intimidating. But then uh, on the first day, I, I kind of, you know, kept to myself. Uh, on the second day, I said, listen, I can't go back home empty handed. My company is going to, you know, ask me to resign if I spend that kind of money and not do anything. So I mustered the courage to sort of start talking to people. So it was, um, uh, that's how the journey started. And of course, I started making friends and, you know, I got involved with uh, the non-ferrous division. Uh, I spent about 12 years uh, with the non-ferrous division. Um, this year, I, I, I kind of stepped down as the president of the division and uh, Paul Coite, who's from your area, has uh, taken over. And uh, I have taken the responsibility of being the treasurer of the organization. I think I, again, as I say that for our industry, I think uh, BIR, basically is a very, very effective platform for our industry to, to make our voices heard. And what I realize is that all the big plans that we have with, uh, uh, with BIR in terms of what it intends to do for the industry, in terms of its advocacy and in terms of the representation, you need a very strong financial power. Uh, the fiscal measures have to be right. And I see that, you know, I should be able to contribute better in terms of these uh, plans that we have. So that's where I am now today as the treasurer and about over 20 happy, successful years with the organization. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, it's funny, I could speak for days about um, how we all start a bit shy uh, at the VAR, and, and it seems really daunting and scary. But then as soon as you start speaking to people, you realize everybody's actually approachable and, and everybody wants to talk to you. Um, but Absolutely. initially, it's, um, it's like looking at great white sharks in a room and trying to have the confidence to go up there and, and, and talk to them. So, yeah, it's um, 
it's an interesting no, I think, world that we've all been through it. So as I said that, you know, observing that, you know, how things have spanned out and how they have evolved, I mean, I, I feel extremely delighted, happy, excited when I see so many youngsters being part of this forum and the confidence what they hold, the, you know, the, the, their way of approaching things, you know, it's, it's so beautiful. And I, I think that's what the future is, you know, and I, I think the ad is doing it uh, in the right way. And I, I, again, as I said, this is likely to even grow further. And I think uh, we, we should encourage more of such things where young people who are starting their career get their fair bit of an opportunity. And VR is absolutely the forum which kind of, you know, creates those opportunities for them to come, to speak, be without fear and uh, make your business go. Yeah, agree, agree completely. Um, Dal, well, talk me through, you know, you've been doing this for quite a while. Talk me through a tough trade that you've had to deal with in the past. You know, something that was really um, hard to get through. And what's one of those experiences that have taught you so much and, and helped you learn, right? We always say that um, you learn through the tough times. It's not when it's, it's smooth sailing, you know, um, you don't really learn much during those times. So can you think of one that sticks out for you? Uh, again, Stuart, you know, 27 years into this business and perhaps uh, seeing probably more than uh, three cycles of the of boom and bust. And, you know, I, I, I think life teaches you a lot. Uh, the business teaches you a lot. And I think uh, by end of the day, all what you need to do is sort of, you know, look at every experience, you know, see, learn, uh, analyze that how you could have done better and make sure that, you know, for whatever those learnings are, you process all of that and make sure that you don't do the same mistakes again. I mean, of course, when things are difficult, it's, it's going to put you through a challenge. The idea is that all these experiences must sort of, you know, make sure that these challenges are handled well in a future day and time when the crisis like these strike. I mean, you asked me about um, special I mean, occasions which uh, kind of stand out. I think if, if I go back in time and if I see that, you know, how things have uh, spanned out for me, I think sometimes, you know, as a youngster, uh, what I felt in that period uh, was that, you know, if I've done something, um, I, I definitely want to expand and grow my markets, grow the product lines. But I think by end of the day, excitement is very short lived. I think what you need is a great, a good strategy. What you need is a thinking head. And sometimes in course of this excitement that I had as a youngster, I perhaps stepped into areas and, you know, zones, which I perhaps should have taken my time to process uh, all of that, you know, the nuances that it brings along. So I think uh, one or two cases uh, I remember, I think the first one that stands out in my memory, which kind of was a little bit of a disaster for me, was uh, as part of our my growth plan, uh, when I started with international business, third country business, I thought I can achieve the world. And I started with, uh, you know, slowly into Southeast Asia. Uh, in Thailand, we had a case where we bought something from a company. Um, the person who represented the company uh, was kind of a well-trained uh, a person who can sort of, you know, fool you easily. And as I said, in my excitement, I forgot to do my due diligence. So they made a contract with us uh, without uh, doing my due diligence. I, we, we transferred uh, a big amount of advance to them. And then despite all the, you know, because he was very good at name dropping, you know, so he, he kind of gave a little bit of history of his company on the phone and said, OK, I'm dealing with uh, so and so person and all the big names, big companies that he said. And I got too excited with that. I probably should have held my, horse, my horses back and should have sort of, you know, gone back in terms of thinking that, you know, uh, how, how this needs to be executed. But I guess I, I parted with my company's money. I, I paid a big fat advance to them and uh, I wouldn't see the guy ever again, not on the phone, uh, nowhere. So I had to spend about um, a month and a half in Thailand. I was on a wild goose chase. We hired companies, professional companies who would help us uh, chasing this guy. And uh, it was a commercial contract, so the police wouldn't help. But all in all, I would say that while the business is growing, while, you know, there's a lot of energy, a lot of young talent that's coming in. My only piece of advice is that take your time, um, do your due diligence, and then kind of step into anything which is new. Could be exciting. Of course, not that everything ends with a, a story like mine, but uh, perhaps you will find uh, the right people and great partners. But again, don't forget to do, do, a, uh, do a due diligence. You know, that's very important. Know the people, just don't fall for stories. 
just make sure that you have uh, documentary evidence to support all of that and then, then kind of step into the new business. Because I think what happens is that when you do a, a bad deal, I think the the time to it takes, the effort it takes to correct it, there are so many good deals you'll have to sacrifice in terms of correcting what you did wrong. So I would say that, you know, we need to minimize that and we need to make sure that uh, your time is effectively used. So from that experience, what I learned is due diligence is extremely important. And still, if you end up with the wrong business or have a better experience, that's at least it will not sort of kill you saying that, you know, uh, that you didn't do your due diligence. So I think make sure that uh, you're dealing with the right people. That's a, that's a tough one to deal with. Um, having to, you actually ran around trying to find the guy, trying to take legal action. I don't actually hear of that. Uh, most of the time, people just realize they've lost their money and there's nothing they can do with it. You know, how many times I've spoken to people that said, you know, let's sign a contract. And they're like, what's the contract for? Because the contract's worth nothing, really. We still like to make sure it's signed. But um, unfortunately, there's not much you can do about it. So to travel through Thailand, um, <laughs> that must have been a, an interesting experience. And you must have learned heaps so I, during that time. I, I, I um, remember this, those days very vividly because uh, those were all very sort of experiences that will kind of stay there for a lifetime. So I met a British guy there. Uh, I still remember the name of the company. It was John Sobel and Company. And they basically specialized in recovery of bad debts. And the way they would do it is just trying to sort of, you know, legally um, entrap those bad performers in terms of like going through their past history. And then they would sort of file a case against them. All in all, I could say that John definitely helped me a lot. And what I realized is that since the time that we went to them for help, uh, in about two years, we recovered our money. Of course, John charged his fees or whatever. But uh, again, it, it was a painful uh, period for me those, those two years because I felt guilty of something. And uh, as I said, that could have been awarded if I went that extra mile or sort of, you know, made sure that I had done my due diligence. That's all. It, it reminds me of the saying, success is a terrible teacher, right? If everything just went smoothly for you during that time, who knows if you'd be where you are now, right? And it's, you, you even remember the companies that you dealt with there because they burnt a hole. They burnt their name in the back of your eyes or in your memory because those, those days won't be forgotten very quickly. You know, you'll be surprised that uh, when people came to know that uh, how this company has helped us and, you know, the things that I achieved in Thailand, a lot of my friends came to me and they got me to share details of this particular company, Mr. Sobel's company, because so many of them were cheated had their monies outstanding and they had given it up. But that this one created some sort of a hope that, yes, if double can do it, why can't we chase our money back? And I don't know what, what's been the outcome of, uh, of their cases, but I guess, um, why not? You know, if somebody sort of rubs you the wrong way and, you know, I think our industry is largely comprises of good people and we need to make sure that the bad elements are out and uh, that that's what it is. So I, I would say that it was a crisis, but, that crisis made me learn so much and every opportunity that I see, I think I'm happy that day and to that day and time that I went through this crisis because perhaps the chances of me going wrong again, perhaps gets reduced now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, hopefully you lose as little as possible while learning, right? And you, you actually got some, some money back, which doesn't usually happen. So, um, but I guess you went through those two years, which would have been really stressful. And that's, yeah. that's why you'll never forget that as well. Yeah, but Dawal, you talk about, you obviously spoke to friends after that. Um, you, they then got introduced to this party um, in Thailand for you uh, or, or for them to help them. That's a form of collaboration and you helping out with other, helping other people. It's a word I use a lot, um, collaboration. And it's something that I believe that our industry should do more of. We spoke briefly, you know, earlier about associations, and that's a form of collaboration. Where do you think um, you focus on when it comes to collaboration, or, or what what experience have you got with collaboration in your time in the industry? So, uh, again, as a company, uh, you know, in my personal experiences, and also as I said, that uh, we, we're not. If you if you look at my business, um, and if I just give you a little bit of an insight. I think we are about, you know, brokering today and trading today is all about relationship. It's about forging collaborations as, uh, as well as how you put it. 
you know, back in the day, what I thought is that um, uh, sitting here and of course, you know, having a huge network of friends and associates and, you know, I, I, I would uh, be able to do every business, uh, on, uh, you know, uh, that is, you know, go across Europe, go across the United States, Asia, whatever. Uh, a fair bit of our business is uh, international, I would say, third country business. But uh, I think we've nurtured that business through collaborations. I think by end of the day, uh, as a person, uh, you need to know what your uh, expertise is, uh, what your knowledge is. But I, I think real growth stems out of these collaborations. So we've had, uh, you know, we have we have partners, we have uh, 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 agents, so to speak, uh, channels uh, where we made those collaborations. And I think today, as how we stand, the success lies uh, because of these collaborations that we've made. So in the end, today, however smart you are, however intelligent you are, but let's say that in terms of your productive hours, you have 12, 13 hours in a day, put that to good use. But I think the real growth comes out of these great, good collaborations uh, that you make, because you're not going to be able to reach out to every business, every corner of the world. I think you, you need to create those partnerships and those strategic relationships and nurture them, uh, you know, invest into them and you know, let your business grow. So frankly, uh, we uh, at this point in time, if I, if I look at my business, we are doing business in about 45 odd countries around the world. And that's not easy, you know, with different time zones, you know, culturally, we are all very different people. But by end of the day, uh, I just thank my, my, my relationships, my partners, my associates uh, who make this whole thing work you know and uh, i think that that's the future you know so yeah i am a big fan of collaborations you know good collaborations they say if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together all right that's yeah. um, i think that's... that's absolutely key yeah i think it's always uh, the team wins you know so yeah 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 for sure tell me darwell um 27 years and you've got many years ahead of you. But if you were to look back and think that something stands out for you as a career highlight, something that, um, you know, maybe as a kid, you didn't think that you would ever achieve or get to do or something when you look back that goes, that was an amazing achievement or that's something I really enjoyed. Is there anything that stands out for you like that? Absolutely. I uh, again, so we spoke about BIR and of course it's a global platform and, you know, we have about close to 90 countries participating and it's, 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 it's very global in terms of its reach and in terms of its uh, discussion, the content part of it. But I'll, mo I'll, I'll, I'll move to India right now, you know, uh, as I started my career about 27 years back and then I think I briefly mentioned that India in that period was a, still a very closed economy, you know, we've had a... Uh, foreign trade was not something which was very uh, popular and you had to sort of really, really work hard to create those opportunities. Uh, 12 years back, 13 years back, um, you know, some of talking to some of the industry guys, um, you know, there came a, a policy from the Indian government, which virtually could have put the entire trading community uh, out of business. Uh, so it was a policy which was kind of, you know, poorly thought of. And it was a small little huddle where, you know, 15, 20 traders got into a room, uh, you know, saying that, hey, our scrap business is going to stop, you know, what are we going to do? Because we have this policy coming up from the government and that would virtually sort of, you know, um, get us out of business. Uh, what started as that little huddle and that kind of, you know, discussion uh, transformed into something which was unimaginable. Um, so we, we formed this group. 12 years back, 13 years back, and we said that, okay, we're going to fight this out. Let's talk, uh, you know, rationality. Let's talk logic. Let's kind of, you know, talk to the government. Let's make an approach and see how we go. That was the first step forward uh, or the, you know, the basic seed in terms of like, you know, how uh, MRAI, uh, you mentioned to me early on, you know, when we were discussing offline that, you know, you're planning to come to Calcutta and be part of this uh, huge, uh, big event, uh, MRAI. But uh, as I said, MRAI basically was, uh, you know, was uh, born out of this crisis that we had, that we were facing. And, uh, you know, today, as I say that, you know, every stakeholder which is into industrial material recycling is part of that journey. Uh, you asked me what stands out. So when we approached the government uh, in this period of crisis, 
what we figured out is that despite the, as an industry and you know perhaps we say that we do all a lot of good work uh, there was very little uh, recognition and respect you know in terms of the work that we 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 do or we were doing in that period so when we went to the government and we said that we are a bunch of uh, metal recyclers and uh, you know uh, we produce secondary metals and every bureaucrat that we met the ministers that we met kind of you know look back at us and saying oh uh, you 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 kind of you know i mean their their idea of us was that you know we're garbage collectors you know so to speak you know so there's a term in hindi what they call it as a kabadi wala you know which means that you pick up uh, scrap or you know uh, you know uh, waste from the streets and we said no we are still uh, in an industry we make this 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 secondary metals and they said and what secondary metals because all their life they never knew that there's a, a, a you know a, something called secondary metals for them copper was always copper which is mined copper aluminium was always aluminium which is mined aluminium so it was very sort of you know foreign to them kind of a little alien term to them that you know secondary metals recycling scrap and producing so that's the 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 genesis of uh, you know how our story started in terms of uh, you know packaging this entire secondary industry materials recycling association of india having to come to life and saying that okay if people don't know us then it's time that we you know sort of you know make sure that we become this audible visible part of the industry so we we kind of resolved we combated that thing and we got the correction done so the industry started from that point and uh, year after year i think uh, we we've grown we've spanned out i mean today we are more international i would say but uh, as i said that if i look back in time i think uh, and today we've got perhaps nine policy documents where the government is very interactive with us every single thing which has got to do with circular economy uh, with uh, you know we're talking about standards we're talking about how to grow steel industry how to you know anything to do with metals anything to do with recycling anything to do with uh, circularity sustainability decarbonization mri is into it so becoming this so very indispensable source of information industry uh, a channel a bridge between the industry and the government i think i take extreme pride to say that uh, you know to see this journey to see this baby grown and you know getting that respect that's the most important thing i would say getting that recognition which was not there 12 13 years back so i find that part of it extremely touching to me and perhaps it will stay with me forever i guess that's amazing i i had no clue um how mra i started um i didn't know that you played such an integral role there either um my wife often says to me never let a crisis go to waste um Absolutely. and it's quite funny right some of the greatest things are achieved um while getting through a crisis so that's a perfect example of it i really look forward to january and um, coming to kolkata i haven't attended an mri event before this will be the first so um if anybody's listening i will promote it and uh, make sure to send some videos from um at the event so people can see what it's like and hopefully some people might try it for the first time um the following year so yeah i really look again i i'm i'm pretty positive that uh, you will have an amazing experience just to understand that uh, you know how far have we traveled and how quickly we've traveled in terms of what we do um the understanding of people how uh, the businesses of people and again i would only say that india has done amazingly well first of all i i say that you know the recycling industry uh, is a great enabler in india uh, it's very empowering i would say and of course very enterprising as well it's a very very uh, strong tool for uh, socio economic and environmental transformation in india because um, you know if you if you walk into scrap yards uh, when you see people you know uh, you know you probably see if you go to a big uh, or a mid size uh, scrap yard where people are doing sorting segregation you see probably 200 300 500 people you know in tandem doing you know uh, what they know the best the skill set what they hold what is amazing is that these people who are there in the scrap yard of course there's a lot of uh, a whole lot of women who work on those scrap yards you know people coming from tribal villages and you know small little uh, towns uh, they've skilled themselves to do the separation sorting uh, of materials and but if you look at their lives you know the children go to school uh, they they have uh, you know uh, healthcare 
they you know so what i'm trying to say is that that this industry that way has really given an opportunity um for people to participate it cuts across all uh, you know um uh, streams of you know depend doesn't matter what part of you know society you come from but by end of the day there's a sense of belonging there is a, uh, you know something that you can still provide with this industry so i guess uh, it's a very um uh, it's a great story for me uh, i always get motivated to do more because uh, uh, by end of the day we are recyclers and in you know, 15 years back we were just kind of rack pickers so to speak but i think today nobody could say that and i think as i said that everywhere we go we get treated with respect uh, and i'm sure that you know when i look at the lives how it has transformed for these people who 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 work on the yards and who do what you know the business that we represent i think i'm very happy to see all of those changes you know they are great changes you know that's how societies get changed you know that's how people get changed yeah yeah absolutely um our industry supports millions of people um you know just take away the sustainability and the emission part of it just the actual um support that we give millions of people around the globe um it's a it's an incredible industry um Dole, let's talk about um for exporters, so people that your clients on the one side, I guess, um, they're exporting material to India, aluminium, stainless, copper, whatever it might be, lots of ferrous. Um, what would you recommend these guys do to optimize their trading strategy? So these are the guys that you're buying from. These are guys that you may be not buying from, but just general exporters around the world that might be listening. How can they optimize their trading strategy? Um, you're obviously very experienced, so we'd love to hear from you. Uh, first of all, I think if you look at how India has grown in terms of its uh, appetite uh, for scrap metals and as a strong destination for exporting countries, I think one of the things that perhaps uh, sometimes gets missed is that the, the scale and the size also comes with a bit of a challenge. And that challenge, I think, if uh, negotiated well, navigated well, I think will yield you the results. So my piece of advice to all these exporters is that while India is a big market, I think by end of the day, um, make sure that the understanding of the client or the understanding of the, uh, the company that you have on the other side is, 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 is very strong. And, uh, you know, um, I'm just going to give you uh, an example here that I've also lived in China for two years. And uh, this was way back in two, 2004 and 2005. And, uh, you know, in one breath, a lot of people compare India, China together as, uh, as big markets uh, were receiving scrap metals. I think in that period, uh, wherever I went in, say, south of China in Guangdong, in Foshan, Dali and in Ningbo area, I think there was always this when you sit on a negotiation table, right? If you said, I wanted to sell 100 tons of scrap, say aluminum scrap or brass scrap, they would quote your price. But if you said, I want to sell 500 tons of material, they would give you X plus one. There was always a premium that was attached in terms of like, you know, if you bring up the volumes, you get a premium. Now, put that, cut out that scenario from China and put that into India. It's the reverse. So if you said, I want to sell 100 tons, okay, the price is X. But if you said, I want to sell 200 tons, it's X minus one because India works differently, you know. The mines are very frugal, okay. Um, uh, the economy is based on the sense that, you know, um, quantity is not a winner here. It's, it's the quality of business, you know. And um, so, as I said, that work around with those basic, um, you know, things which understanding the culture that how it works, I would say that don't overexpose yourself. Uh, slowly, gradually try to increase your stakes. At once, if somebody comes to you from India and says that, okay, I'm going to change your fortunes. No, don't get carried away with that. You know, just try it out slowly, gradually, and then build it up. And I, I think that's a strategy that needs to be followed. So uh, make a good research in terms of what you're selling, how you're selling, because obviously still there are taxes. That India, India is a costly market. And when I say costly in terms of logistics, in terms of we are probably in the whole of Southeast Asia, or perhaps in the whole of the world, we're probably still a country which charges a tax on scrap, you know, uh, for importation. We are still an import-based economy and there's a tax that you need to pay if you're importing scrap. So what I'm trying to say is that the costs get led in, you know, they get added up uh, in terms of duties, in terms of logistics. So obviously when the material is not up to the expectations, 
uh, there's invariably a discussion or a, a kind of a standoff between the exporting side and the Indian side where they're talking about, okay, these are my losses. How are you going to sort of compensate us? You know? So what I'm trying to say is that to make sure that you, know, you don't end up with that discussion, the idea is that just know your partner very well. Make sure the understanding is absolutely bang on. Don't even leave anything, not even half a percent, one percent to assumption. Just make sure that the understanding on both sides is extremely uh, you know, you you kind of, you know, 10 on 10, I would say. So I think those little things, and as I said, just, just know the basic cultural thing, you know, that don't go uh, to a person whose appetite is for, say, one container, and if you offer them 10 containers, it's just not the right recipe. It's a recipe to sort of, you know, disaster, I would say. Mm. That's that's very interesting when you, when you um, compare China to India and you talk about the volume differential on prices. Um, when I worked in South Africa, we did some some decent amount of volume. And then when I started a company in New Zealand, obviously it was much smaller. Um, and the hassle of having too much volume to sell into India at a time, you know, every single day was a real thing. I mean, if you wanted that premium price, you had to sell it to smaller niche foundries and through your right partners. And as soon as you went to the larger parties, you know, they're, they're buying from the larger groups and the larger groups have to discount their material because they have so much volume. I saw the same when I worked at Sims. Um, you know, the material that they handle is too big and, and it's very difficult to get that premium all the time that the smaller players can actually get. Now, this is interesting because a lot of people won't know this. A lot of people think I can't compete with Sims um, because I don't have enough volume. No, it isn't actually that. It's having that those relationships and having the ability to get into the right markets or knowing what quality will get you a premium or getting your material marketed properly into the right foundries, right? Absolutely. Which does it does come with having experience of maybe working for bigger global players or or having somehow spent time, like you said, spend time in China, wherever you've been, that gets you into those markets. But it doesn't necessarily mean that because you do less volume than the bigger players, that you cannot compete with them on price. Would you agree with that? I, I again, um, you know, it all goes back to, as a company, uh, how are you constitutionally? What I mean to say is that today, uh, a company as big as Sims or EMR, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, it, it has a scale which they need to operate on. For them, the micromanagement becomes difficult. I do understand the need for them to move quickly with those big volumes and perhaps <clears throat> for them, they are pretty, uh, let's say, correct in chasing the big accounts. But I think um, if you look at the uh, Indian market, I think you have a variety of customers and depending on what your scales are, you can align yourself to meet the right customer on this side, which means if you don't have large volumes, but if you're looking at a good quality relationship, a right value for your product, then you need to invest that much time and that much effort in meeting the right customer or sort of matchmaking sort of, you know, with the right customer. So I think that way we, India has that ability to provide a right match for every scale and size in terms of the exporting, or the exporters needs are. Uh, having said that, I, I can only say that, okay, these are the times as of today. I mean, if you look at the whole, if I just talk about metals today, the secondary side of the business is growing at about, you know, in excess of like 11, 12% uh, CAGR year on year. I don't know what the future brings us, but I, I would still say that depends on, as from an exporter's perspective, I would say India offers you a lot. Uh, just wisely invest your time, wisely invest into the relationship. There is, there's a market for everything. Let's put it that way. We are a very sort of a, a scrap deficient society, so to speak, as of today. I mean, we are trying to sort of, you know, because we started with a low consumption base. So obviously the generation of scrap is a bit slow. And while everybody is now looking at sort of, you know, increasing the footprint in terms of uh, the secondary materials, just to, to sort of, you know, show a, 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 a lower carbon footprint. I think in future and in time, Things will change where India will look at the scale and the size, you know, where everybody's chasing big contracts. But as of today, as I can see, is that there is still a fair play in terms of there is a good, um, let's say, 
Uh, there's a good liquidity, good uh, turnover for every scale, every size. It just you just have to align yourself well and you know choose your partners wisely. Yeah, exactly. You, you spoke about um, it's obviously changed. It's changing. How have you seen the industry change um, over the last you know since you joined? And where do you think? What do you think it'll look like in the next ten years? You know, one of the most fascinating things about uh, the Indian side of the business is, uh, and which has become more and more visible in the last 10 years or so, is that as the industry grew, as businesses grew, the ability to think big and the ability to think international, and you know, that came about. So today, with my business, I mean, 50% of my books today, or probably even more, are third country business. Now, way back in time, when I started my life, my career, I never ever thought that I would be doing business, uh, third country business. You see, I, I thought it was very India centric, and this is what my future is. But over a period of time, what it taught me is that you just have to identify gaps, have to make yourself uh, technically, culturally I mean, able to sort of fill those gaps and try to sort of, you know, explore your business opportunities. I think that element has kind of thrived, so to speak, in India. And today, the ability of Indians to speak international, you know, has grown a fair bit. And it's a lot of companies that I know, friends that I know who are doing international business where they are operating out of India but they are doing third country business. And I think this is so beautiful. It's such an incredible, because as I said, it all happened very fast. You know, we were never culturally known. We were never sort of trained to do all of these things, but now it's happening. So when, you know, say Hindalco is now in Novalis is owned by them, you know, when they set their footprint and become like global leaders uh, or Tata's for that matter, you know, in the automotive segment, when they have JLR or Tata Steel or whatever, I mean, these are stories which I love to tell to my kids and to say that, you know, when you start your working life, you know, never be, uh, let's say, uh, intimidated by the world. Just put your best foot forward and just come up with a good idea and go international. You know, there are no dividing lines anymore uh, that could sort of stop you from, you know, doing business in A country or B country. The world is one big playground. Just, just find your play and just, you know, be the best. That's all. So I, I think, that, that's how things have changed in India, that the Indian businesses today don't consider themselves confined to a particular area or, you know, you know, the thinking is very international. The thinking is very modern, so to speak. The, the jugglery is no more there. Um, while, as I said, that they are a frugal, uh, we are a frugal mindset. But at the same time, frugal does not mean that being less advanced or like you know compromising with stuff i think everybody wants to be the best right now and i think the next 10 15 years what you'll see stuart is that uh, these businesses uh, will expand a lot internationally mm. yeah i think india is going to be a huge player is already a huge player and i think um, that's only going to grow on the global scene yeah i think uh, uh, of course uh, you know i would say the policies also have helped Today, uh, the incumbent government understands that uh, while the finances are there, the enterprising minds are there, it's just that you need policies as well to sort of, you know, align yourself in terms of this international growth. So I guess the policies also have uh, gone well. Indian businesses are receptive to that. And I think, as I said, that, uh, you know, today no idea comes with some sort of confinement that, okay, this is my threshold. I think today we feel, and I'm sure around the world, you know, possibilities are immense. You become limitless, so to speak. And, uh, you know, just make sure that, you know, you, you make an impact, you know, I mean, something which is without an impact will definitely fall flat. But as long as you're effective and as long as that impact is there, I'm sure you would do well in life. Yeah, yeah, 100% agree. Um, Darwell, this has been amazing but we're running out of time there's there's a there's a way that i finish every episode which is just a little bit of getting to know you a little bit better so some quick questions um so when people do meet you at the mrai or the bar you know they've got some stuff in common with you is there a favorite tv series you have or a favorite movie you've watched um what's your favorite so i like suits a lot of course uh but again cool. uh, i don't know how much that would help but uh 
you know, one of the greatest books that I, I mean, because since we're talking, we were talking business and then, you know, how that has kind of, you know, impacted uh, or a change that has been brought about is uh, one book called Maverick. Uh, I don't know if you've read that from Ricardo Sembler. And uh, mm -hmm. it's about a, a Brazilian conglomerate. So Ricardo is, you know, young and he joins his business and, you know, um, how he turns around. Uh, despite the scale and the size, what it basically ends up with is that how simplicity kind of changes everything all and while being very effective. So there are a lot of things that one would learn in terms of day to day business. And I've learned a lot from that book. So I guess uh, that's something that I would uh, recommend my friends to read mm -hmm. as well. And it's, it's a great book, you know, that how um, things can change, scales can change tremendously. Despite, you know, uh, there's no vanity there. It's all about logic. It's all about common sense. That's all. Mm. So that's called Maverick, right? Maverick, yeah. Maverick. And your favorite TV series is Suits. Good to know. Yeah. Have you got a, um, a favorite place to visit? Favorite place to visit? Uh, you know, I, I hate myself when I say this, but New Zealand, because <laughs> this, because 27 years of uh, travels, you know, and I guess been to every country, every continent, but one place that has been eluding so far is New Zealand. And uh, it's a beautiful country and so many great stories that are people, friends who visited there, come back with some great memories. So all in all, it's there on my bucket list, top on my bucket list. And I, I someday, you know, I'm just going to experience the beauty of your country, Stuart. Two things. One, I'll absolutely host you anytime. I look I forward that, to you man. coming to visit, you and your family anytime. Two, I know it's a bit far, but maybe we go to BIR to do it in uh, to do it in New Zealand. It's a bit far for everybody because I know because I go to the BIRs and have to travel the other way. But if they one day did that, I'd, I'd be interested to see how well that was attended. So I'll I'll, I'll set the chronology. Uh, you invite me there. We'll over a a beer or something. We'll talk about it, and then it's absolutely coming for sure. BIR is going to be in New Zealand. Sound, <laughs> sounds sounds great. When you mentioned your favorite book being Maverick. And before that, you mentioned um, inspirational um, people that have come out of, you know, if you look at Tata and inspirational companies, straight away, I thought about Cold Steel. Have you read Cold Steel, the Lakshmi Mittal book? Unfortunately not. But you tell me, you so share I, me your learnings from that, and I'm sure I'll, I'll make sure that I go to the bookstore today and buy it immediately. It is, I guess a few years ago, I used to say it was the best book I ever read specifically because um, it was so relatable for me, as in from our industry, right? Um, but it's written in such a way that they could make a Hollywood movie out of it. Like really? it is it is exciting. It is, oh, it's captivating. It, it is brilliant. I mean, you obviously kind of know how it ends, but I, you've got to get to read Cold Steel. I remember... Oh, this is maybe, I can't remember what year, maybe eight years ago, or even longer, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It was voted best business book of the year by some by some magazine. Um, really a fantastic book. And I think very relatable for you. You talk about inspiring kids. I think it's worth reading um, Cold Steel. Definitely. Well, it's two o'clock here in the afternoon. I think before end of today, I'll lay my hands on that book and I'll, I'll share offline perhaps uh, how do I find that. You know, I'm, I'm sure Fantastic. it's a That's great awesome. book, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. Brilliant. And the last thing I'd like to ask before we head off is, have you got a favorite quote, something that inspires you or inspires your team? So out of experience, okay, uh, we talked about the boom and the bus cycles and I you know what this life has offered us, the, the our, our businesses have offered us. Uh, one quote I would say, which kind of stays with me and I'm, I'm stuck to it is that uh, turnover is vanity profit is sanity and cash is king you know i mean ultimately i i'm not a big fan of like you know uh, heavy borrowings and stuff like that i like to keep my business simple and uh, that that's what it is and healthy let's put it that way so when they say cash is king i think that basically refers to the financial health of businesses as long as you know you know that and i think everything else to me and you know in in the last 10 15 years i mean we've seen a whole lot of companies which have grown on turnovers and you know there was a time when like you know as i told you in, in, the, in the mid 2000s like you know when i was in china everybody had the so-called let's say it was a slogan you know that i am number one 
and it didn't matter you know where which company you entered he would always say that i'm number one you know and there came a time when indians also sort of got a little carried away with this i'm number one number two or whatever but by end of the day i'm not a big fan of that whether you're number one or number 100 or number 50 i don't care as long as you're financially healthy so i think as i said to me turnover is real vanity profit is sanity and the ultimate is cash which is the king uh, my father-in-law taught me that um, about f probably about 10 years ago, maybe longer. Um, and it's always stuck with me. It, it, it's brilliant. It should be written on your wall in your office. Um, and I think everybody should really um, take heed to that. Dowell, thank you so much for being on the episode, mate. I've really enjoyed my time with you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to New Zealand. <laughs> exactly. You'll host me in Kolkata. I'll host you in Auckland. And it's a done deal. It's a great awesome. deal for me. Calcutta is cheap, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure you spend twice the money. Yeah, that'll happen for sure. Thanks, Donald. Thank you so much. Cheers. Eh? It's nice Bye. chatting up, man. You take care.